Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our September 3rd Thursday presentation. Um, I hope, uh, hope things are going well, your vineyards are um, thriving, if not producing. I was tasting grapes in a vineyard last week, so um, that's pretty exciting in on the Naramata bench, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, but so today's presentation is regarding um, clean plant material, which is uh, very timely to the situation we're all in as we're um, looking to replant. So first we have um, Sahar Mian, who is the research and innovation manager at Genome BC. And, um, and then we'll, I'll come back to you to introduce our next presenter. Um, Thank, thanks for being here, Sahar. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, I just wanted to yeah, present before the main presentation today and provide a little bit of background on this initiative. Um, before I begin, I want to respectfully acknowledge that our office space is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. Um, for those not familiar with Genome BC, we're an organisation that invests in omics research to improve the lives of British Columbians and Canadians. Um, since the start of Genome BC in the year 2000, we've invested 1.3 billion in over 500 research projects, uh, technology platforms and innovation initiatives. Um, we've involved, been involved in over a thousand collaborations with partners uh, in BC, uh, in Canada and also internationally. So we really try and foster collaborations between academia and industry to build these networks, um, attract co-investment. And today we to date, we have advanced 199 BC based companies as well. So through this, we kind of hope to position ourselves as a leader in catalyzing partnerships and advancing genomics technologies. Um, but we don't kind of work in a bubble. We are part of a larger genomic enterprise. Um, with each province having access to a regional genome centre um, and Genome Canada kind of standing as a federal funding agency. Um, each centre is unique and independent. Uh, we each run our own competitions uh, that kind of align with areas of importance for each province, but we do collaborate as well to support a national approach um, and compete for funding from Genome Canada. So our areas of focus are aligned with sectors of strategic importance for British Columbia, and we have an agri-food and natural resources portfolio, which spans uh, areas looking at forestry, fisheries, uh, the environment, mining, energy, and agri-food. We also have another major portfolio, which is health, uh, spanning projects relating to pharmacogenomics, cancer research, diagnostics, and also rare disease research. And finally, we have a data team, which also looks into um, it kind of is integrated into all of these sectors and looks for areas of expansion in genomics using large data sets. Um, when we look at our current and future investments, what really drives us is our alignment to strategic plans, um, specifically for the agri-food and natural resources portfolio. We have three main pillars we like to consider, which are food security, renewable resources and resilient ecosystems. We're really hoping to develop omics resources in these areas and assess how they can be um, implemented across key sectors in BC, driving innovation towards a sustainable bioeconomy. Particularly aligning with our food security pillar, we've invested in areas like developing climate change resilient crops and disease resilient crops, or using genomics to enhance breeding programs for desirable traits in agronomically important species. Uh, in recent years, there's been a particular increase in the need for the development of pests and pathogen detection tools. So we've been working in this space for quite a while to kind of build up these resources, build the network and bring together various stakeholders to support a concerted effort to provide clean and healthy plant material across the agri-food sector. So previously, we've worked on a few projects with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and also the Centre for Plant Health to develop these resources and technologies, particularly in next, genera next generation sequencing technology um, for the detection of viruses, particularly in prop propagative tree fruit material and also in strawberries, both of which are quite important for our imports and exports in British Columbia. So 
When this opportunity came up uh, through a Genome Canada funded initiative, we were quite motivated to be able to expand these efforts and bring in national players. So working with Genome Quebec, we were able to leverage our existing relationship with the CFIA and the Centre for Plant Health, um, and crucially bring in the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network um, to support this national approach, um, really to benefit the whole industry across Canada. Um, I won't be giving too much else away, uh, and I'll uh, make space for yeah, the, the rest of the presentation. But if you do have any questions about GeneMBC, or if you'd like to know more, um, please feel free to reach out to us and head to our website if you'd like to know more um, on our current opportunities as well. And I also, yeah, I also have David Shaway here with me, who's the director of the Agri-Food and Natural Resources team, um, who heads up the team. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to both of us. Thank you, Sahar. Um, and Kate will um, shoot off um, everyone's contact info after the meeting so that, you know, if you if you do want to contact Sahar directly, you'll be able to do that. Um, and I will just introduce Suid. Sorry, having some technical issues. Um, Dr. Uh, Sudarsana Pujari is a principal scientist and adjunct professor at Brock University's Cool Climate, Enology, and Viticulture Institute in Ontario. Sud received his PhD in plant pathology from Washington State University. Before joining Covey, Sud completed his NSERC postdoctoral fellowship at um, Summerlin Research and Development Center with Dr. Urbez Torres and Dr. Tom Lowry on research projects focused on understanding the epidemiology of grapevine viruses and insect vectors in BC. Sud leads the National Grapevine Virus Testing Facility and Grapevine Clean Plant Program at Brock University. His research is focused on advanced molecular diagnostics, epidemiology, insect vector host interactions, and sustainable disease management solutions for plant viral diseases. Welcome, Sid. Uh, thanks, Katie. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide and just tell me if you can see the progression of my slides. Okay. Okay. So, um, again, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to share some of the information on the Clean Plant Program. Um, I won't be too technical in this presentation, um, given the, the the background of the audience. But uh, just to give you an outline, you know, I'll be giving a bit of introduction on like um, you know why uh, we had to detect uh, grapevine viruses uh, and and what's the role in the, the especially in the clean plant program as we are talking about the um, the clean plant program a lot recently. And also, um, you know, what are the recent uh, developments uh, in terms of the, the cleansed project that uh, Sar um, Jan just uh, spoke about and, uh, you know, what we are, um, um, how we are collaborating with uh, institutions like the, so the, the departments like CFIA or AFC um, in, in bringing these new technologies, uh, especially into the clean plan program. Uh, and also building some of the infrastructure uh, to enhance uh, our capacity um, to produce more more uh, clean uh, grape wines. So with that, um, uh, I just wanted to put this slide out and uh, just to give a bit of you know background on um, what actually uh, causes uh, the changes in the virus detection methods like. Uh, constantly, we've been seeing okay, there's new technologies are developed, you know, because um, the viruses, uh, you know, they are changing because uh, there are a lot of influences on them as as a pathogens. You know, there could be influence of the uh, environmental factors um, like the climate, the, the seasonal climate changes that we are seeing recently. Um, and not just that, you know, there will be 
um, uh, influence on the, the, the insect populations, for example, especially the insects that are capable of, uh, you know, spreading or transmitting, uh, capable of transmitting these viral diseases. Um, and also on the grapevines itself, because of the change you know, in climatic conditions, the way that um, we propagate or we uh, introduce new varieties, uh, say, for example, um, as the, the heat units are getting higher and higher every year, for example, we might be changing more into more vinifera varieties, for example, which, which we might not be um, growing uh, often uh, here in this cool climatic conditions. So all these factors will have an influence on viral diseases, especially the, the viruses that cause these viral diseases. They might have, uh, they might go, go through a lot of, um, say for example, mutations and that might bring up new strains of the same viral species or even there would there would be some emerging viral diseases. Say, um, just to give an example, um, grapevine red blotch virus. Uh, before 2012, uh, we didn't even know that, that that this type of virus exists. Um, we used to see um, the red viniferas with um, uh, the on the mature leaves. You know the the symptoms typically um, the purple uh, color discoloration, green veins. Um, we thought that we used to think that it's a typical symptoms of leaf roll disease, uh, which, um, you know, uh, when you look at the, the genetic composition of the, the leaf roll disease, um, its genome is um, RNA, for example. Um, but when you compare to the red blotch virus, which is uh, which genome is a DNA, uh, and that's how we used to miss it because we used to test for um, specific tests that are targeting the RNA viruses, like we used to do the RT-PCRs, for example, and that's how we used to miss it. So, but with the, um, you know, with the advancement of technologies like uh, high throughput sequencing, which I'll be talking about a little, uh, uh, a little deeper in, in the next few slides, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, not just explore um, the viruses, you know, the, the, the specific type of viruses, but it, uh, all all type of viruses, for example. So we'll be talking about like what are the advantages, disadvantages of um, PCRs or quantitative PCRs or high throughput sequencing um, uh, throughout throughout this presentation. So. Before going that, you know, one thing that I always want to emphasize um, uh, to the to the growing community and the scientific community is that we grow grapes uh, because these are vegetatively propagated. So the primary uh, spread or transmission or you know dispersion of these viruses or viruses-like agents or occurs through the planting material because most of the time we uh, we grow the grafted uh, grapevines. That means we have rootstock and we have scion. That means we are dealing with two different uh, planting material uh, to get to a successful uh, grapevine that has to be planted in the, in, in the vineyard when you are establishing a, a new vineyard block, for example. So that means when you are buying these grapevines from a nursery, this, uh, whether it is like a Merlot, Chardonnay, these are grafted onto rootstocks, uh, for example, on uh, 3309 SO4, depending on soil type. And why we use those uh, root stocks? Because they are resilient to certain uh, certain pathogens, uh, uh, except for example, phylloxera. Uh, and also um, they are more uh, efficient in controlling the nutrient and water uptake, uh, uptake from different soil types and probably regulate the growth of the cyan material, which is important to us because that's where our fruit uh, that we are going to harvest to make the wine. So because we have two different things involved, um, it doesn't matter whether the virus is uh, contaminated in the rootstock or in the cyan material. If you graft them, the virus will can move up and down and it will be it will become systemic and the, the resulting, uh, the daughter wine uh, will still have a virus. Uh, sometimes we see growers complaining after a couple of years because the Sometimes the root, the virus is in the rootstock, 
to move from the rootstock to cyan and express the symptoms, it may take a couple of years. And then uh, that's where typically you, um, the, we see complaints from the growers that, hey, after a couple of years, I'm seeing this. Uh, so that means maybe uh, uh, the problem coming from the rootstock. So, um, and then if you are doing a wound rooted wines, that means you have a mother wine that is infected. If you take the cuttings, obviously the, the daughter wines are getting infected. So irrespective of like the secondary spread, secondary spread occurs in the vineyards through say, like for example, um, uh, insect vectors. Um, we have a known insect vectors like mealybugs for a certain type of uh, leaf roll, um, grapevine leaf roll associated viruses, except for leaf roll associated virus two, uh, and also soft scale insects for uh, grapevine leaf roll associated viruses. Um, we do know that uh, certain uh, species of tree hopper, like alpha alpha tree hopper, uh, is a known vector for grapevine red blotch disease. But irrespective of the secondary disease, which probably we can control it because if we control the insects, we can control the secondary spread. Um, but the primary and the most efficient, uh, uh, most common uh, spread that occurs through is the planting material. And that's the reason that the clean plant program is very important. Although we always say starting clean and staying clean is as important uh, to each other because once you start uh, with the clean or virus-free planting material, it is also important to you stay clean. That means you need to have follow the the integrated pest management approaches, especially in controlling those uh, insect insects that are capable of spreading these viruses. Say, for example, your neighboring block or adjacent block has this virus and also has this mealy box, for example, for leaf roll virus. You need to make sure that you need to protect your new blocks getting um, contaminated from the old blocks, especially with the, the viruliferous, the, the mealy box that has this virus. So that's why important. The, when you have in doubt, testing is very important. I'm not showing. I'm not going to show any symptom uh, on different leaves and different varieties in this presentation. Uh, you you probably might have an idea of how they look like, uh, but why it is important to test. Um, for example, um, although there are um, certain differences um, between, say, for example, leaf roll and red blotch viruses especially on the red fruited cultivars. Um, some say that leaf roll will be like um, uh, edges of the leaves, mature leaves will be curled. That's why it's called leaf roll. And red blotch, it is like a blotchy, uh, purple uh, blotchy symptoms. Uh, um, that's why it's called red blotch. But um, those symptoms uh, can be confusing sometimes. We have seen um, uh, both type of symptoms in both cases uh, alone, say like leaf roll showing blotchy symptoms and also um, a red blotch is showing sometimes uh, yeah, curling of the leaves. Uh, but that's 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 why we need to um, uh, we we can we can take some indications from the symptoms, but we cannot completely rely on it. And also, testing is important to know where the source material is coming, where where the source of the virus is coming from. Say like. In the distribution chain, if you want to track back, especially in the clean plant program, we use a lot of uh, barcoding, um, things like that to make sure that, you know, when we test it, uh, the, uh, and when it reaches to the client, the grower, um, based on some type of tracking system, we can track back if, say, like if you uh, find some contaminated material. And also it is very important in the plant protection and quarantine, uh, although that's not uh, mandatory from the university point of view, but say like uh, um, the regulatory agencies like Canadian Food Inspection Agencies uh, or uh, national and domestic or international quarantine facilities, the diagnostics is very important. You need to have a very good diagnostic method for certain type of pathogens, especially the ones uh, that are uh, labeled as uh, the quarantine pathogens. Uh, and obviously, it is very important in the disease management, as, as I was mentioning, starting clean and staying clean, especially in the staying clean, you need to know once you have this vineyard and it has to be a part of your management program to make sure that you are monitoring um, those wines for like virus and virus-like symptoms. And when you are in doubt, just make sure that you test the representative sample and make sure that uh, whether it is... Um, uh, 
a nutrient deficiency or confused between um, the, uh, some other stress, for example, that can probably mimic uh, symptoms like virus, virus diseases. And also clean plant programs. Uh, of course, the, for the sustainability of the production systems, you know, um, we have to heavily depend on the health status and of the propagating material and where um, and the sensitive and reliable uh, diagnostic methods are very critical. So with that, um, I just want to uh, uh, give you a brief uh, overview of how the clean plant program works. Um, it's, um, as you can see in this diagram, uh, we have a cyan material and rootstock. Um, any certification agency, um, they have a certain list of viruses based on, you know, whether in the country or the, in that particular region, what are the important, economically important viruses or other pathogens. So they list in, in their certification uh, protocol and say like, okay, if you want to get certified in this uh, country, in this region, it has to be free from certain uh, type of viruses. So we need, so typically in a certification program, we test either anything that is entering into the program for that that many number of uh, pathogens. And if it found positive, so we uh, go through a process called virus elimination, which is called a meristem tip tissue culture, which is basically you take the tip of the virus infected plant uh, shoot, for example, and then put it uh, under the microscope uh, zoom it probably 100, 100, uh, 100 mag 100 x magnification, and then try to find this meristem at the tip and try to exercise 0.1 to 0 0.05 millimeter size uh, very precisely. And because this particular part of the plant is not well um, uh, developed in terms of um, you know how the cells are differentiated, so that means they are free of the viruses or uh, other virus-like agents. So you exercise that and you try to grow them on a nutrient media in a in a petri dish, for example, in artificial conditions. So then that will be um, grown into a, a new plant. Probably it takes like eight to twelve months uh, to get to, to a, like a, a one feet uh, length of the plant. And then that's what we call the nuclear stock. And from there, uh, the propagation starts. Usually it will go to acclimatization in the greenhouse and then probably it will go to a, a mother block, um, where what you call the propagation stock. And then you use that propagation stock for uh, both cyan and root stock and you graft them. And then that's what, what you call typically a certified stock. So, there will be a generations if you take from this first generation what we call the G1. Uh, if you propagate from there, we call G2, and then you propagate from G2 to G3, uh, so on, uh, based on how much is the demand from the from from the growers. Um, it could be a G2 that would be selling as a certified block, or it could be G4. Uh, typically in the U.S. system, it would be G4. Um, so. With that, um, I just want to uh, come back to the diagnostics. Um, as I was mentioning, there is symptom-based diagnostics, um, which is sometimes non-specific, inaccurate. Uh, and then there is another um, uh, way of called biological indexing, which typically you take an um, a infected rootstock and then graft um, healthy cyan material, which is a very good indicator, say, for example, tephron, things like that. Um, uh, varieties like that, and try to, um, uh, after you make successful graphs, try to wait for, uh, you know, maybe a year or two to see if the symptoms are uh, showing up in the, in the cyan material, the, the growth uh, from the cyan material. That means infected rootstock, the virus is moving from the rootstock to cyan and try to express the symptoms. So as, as you are, um, you, you can assume that this is very, uh, time-consuming and labor-intensive process, but it is a very accurate method, uh, which is called the biological indexing. And then uh, since, because we are talking about the viruses, which is a uh, uh, very intelligent um, pathogen, I would say, but it has only two components in it. When you see the composition of the virus, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have seen when the COVID-19 come, they, they're putting all these cartoons of the virus particle with a, with the circular ball-like structure with all the spikes. So that means there is like those spikes are nothing but proteins 
and then inside that ball there is the nucleic acid which is, which is the genetic material of the virus so it doesn't code for anything else it is not a very complex organisms organism like eukaryotic organisms so all it does is it um, binds to the cell surface with some type of receptors say say like in the plant cell and then when it binds uh, it releases nucleic acid into the plant cell and it uses all the, the the requirements that it needed for its own replication from the plant cell components. So that's how intelligent it is. So that means it is leaving us with only two options when you want to, if you want to detect it, you either have to go for a protein-based detection or a nucleic acid-based detection. So that's what we call serological uh, methods or protein-based. Um, say uh, these are uh, specific to specific viruses because uh, and some of the disadvantages, uh, the antibodies uh, is not available or not, uh, not possible for uh, to develop for all type of uh, viral species. And it is obviously less sensitive than PCR. Um, say, um, for example, if, we, if you are, um, if you compare, say, like a COVID diagnostic test, um, they're giving you a strip uh, test. That is a protein-based test. So that you can, uh, when you insert that uh, strip um, into, say, like a, a saliva or something uh, which has the viral nucleic acids, and then it it will try to uh, viral proteins, for sorry, sorry, and then it will try to bind to those antibodies, and then uh, which is again linked to some kind of conjugate, which can kind of give you some colored reactions, and then you can detect it um, the uh, one 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 lane or two lanes based on that. Those are um, protein-based detection techniques. And then uh, we are left with the nucleic acid-based detection, the PCRs, the RT-PCRs, or quantitative PCRs, or digital droplet PCRs. Even the next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing, what we call, is all uh, based on the nucleic acids. So these are all highly specific and they can have a lot of advantages, which we'll discuss uh, in a few slides. Uh, so, PCR-based diagnostics are pretty uh, standard um, in most of the clean plant programs uh, because they're very uh, specific to certain viruses. Um, typically, it involves if you have an infected planting material, you extract the nucleic acids, run through a, a PCR a machine, which kind of amplifies a particular portion, particular part of the genome of a, a, a virus species, and multiplies into uh, uh, probably a few million copies. And then once it is amplified, you run through uh, uh, a gel uh, or electrophoresis uh, process uh, to make sure that you estimate the size of those amplified um, gene product, or amplified uh, genetic material, and compare that with, uh, say, like a reference uh, size markers, as well as the positive controls. That's how you compare and say, like, if it matches those amplicon, amplified product with the positive control, then you say positive. Uh, so this is basically giving you a or no answer. Uh, um, apart from that, you don't have any other uh, application. Uh, but if you go for further with the quantitative PCRs, like, um, you know, either cyber green or digital droplet PCRs, they not only tell you whether it is a yes or no answer, like a present or uh, absent answer, but also tells you how much it is, like how much of the virus concentration, uh, how much, how many copies of the viral nucleic acids are present in a given sample. So these are more specific and more um, technically laborious as well, and also a bit expensive than PCRs, but they have it, their own advantages. Example. Um, say, if you are trying to study epidemiology of a virus, trying to find uh, which is the vector for, say, for example, red blotch virus. So you can actually go find a few different species of insects and try to dissect them into different body parts and try to identify, okay, in which body part of this insect um, the virus is present more. Um, so that those kind of experiments would give you a clue like, okay, whether it is a potential insect vector or not. So especially in those type of experiments, or if you want to quantify, in a, say, for example, in a given season, uh, in, a, in a grapevine that is in the commercial vineyard, you want to know which part of the plant has more virus. 
Um, so you can do this quanti uh, quantificate quant uh, quantitative uh, PCRs uh, to determine okay uh, what is the best time to detect the virus in a given uh, a given sample given uh, in a given season. So with those advantages, I'm putting this um, uh, bit um, heavy table here with the text. Uh, um, um, excuse me about that, but I just wanted to emphasize uh, when you read this slide, um, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages um, of especially between conventional PCRs and the real-time PCRs and digital PCRs. And then we talk more about the high throughput sequencing uh, from now on. So as I was mentioning, high throughput sequencing, say, um, basically when you compare, okay, tell me, Sudhu, like what is the basic difference between um, PCR and high throughput sequencing? Say, I would say PCR, you have to do, uh, say, if you are looking at 30 different virus species in your certification program, you have to do 30 different tests. Maybe there is a possibility that you can develop uh, duplex or multiplex for certain type of viruses, but not for all. It is completely not possible. So you need to do individual tests to make sure that it is accurate and, uh, and what, you are, what you are getting. But high throughput sequencing is not like that. High throughput sequencing, you just do one test for all type of viruses, whether those 30 different viruses in your certification program or you know, maybe 100 different viruses that are susceptible to infect the grape vines. If it is infected, you will go into get and detect it at the same time with more accuracy and more sensitivity because of the, the comprehensiveness of this test. And because of this comprehensiveness, obviously it, it, it does cost a little more than the regular PCRs and the quantitative PCRs, but there are different ways of detecting it. Say, even though high throughput sequencing, um, there could be uh, multiple ways. Like if you, even if you want to do a human genome sequencing, you can do a high throughput sequencing and get the data. Uh, if you want to do a, a grape point genome sequencing, there is a different type of uh, protocol that you have to follow and do the same high throughput sequencing, you get the data. But if you want to detect the only viruses, uh, there is also some methods called viral enrichment methods that you can, uh, you can see here. Uh, whether it is total nucleic acids, uh, total RNA, um, if we want to uh, even go for ribodepletion, RNA, poly A depletion, um, just use the total nucleic acids or use the small RNAs or viral RNAs, uh, like the double standard RNA and things like that. So I'm not going completely into the details, but if anybody wants um, explanation for those, please contact me. But just for the sake of audience, I'm just giving you an overview here so what it does is uh, it's a bit more complex in terms of a protocol, how we follow um, the, how we do this high throughput sequencing. Once you extract the nucleic acid, you have to uh, go through certain steps called you know, making cDNA libraries and then running through a, a sequencing machine uh, for, uh, for getting all the sequences. And once you get the large amount of sequence data, that is the genetic material, the information of the genetic material, uh, what we call the sequence data. And this is the large amount of data. And you need to have a, um, a certain bioinformatic tools like Virtool that I mentioned that uh, Dr. Mike Rod has um, successfully developed with, with, in collaboration with uh, a few other researchers in the Cleanser project. Um, so you need to have these certain tools to process all this data and to make sure that uh, you know the, the data that we generated we compare that to that existing viral sequence data that is available publicly in the public domain, like public databases, what we call the gene banks. So we compare this data with the existing data, and then you will get a list of viruses or virus-like agents or viroids that are there in your sample. So with, with those processing and analysis, you get to know what type of virus, not only what type of viruses that is present in a given sample, but also the genetic information of the virus. So that means you can use the genetic information and compare phylogenetically how it is related with the other existing viral species, whether uh, what is the source of it, like where it is coming from, all those downstream applications can be possible. 
And once you get the data, it is not just um, sitting there, say, for example, you have a repository, Grapevine germplasm repository, and you are tested. And then a few years later, you found some other virus. You can go back to the same data and find that whether that particular new virus is there in, the, in that particular sample at the time or not. So it, this is a bit comprehensive. It, it, it gives a lot of data, but also it gives, um, you know, some of some, it poses some of the questions whether is there any new viruses or is there any uh, regulated pathogens that is there? Everything you get, and uh, that, that's that's the decision you want to make, like how how you want to use this data. So I have given again a, a table to compare between the PCR-based uh, virus diagnostics and the high throughput sequence, um, uh, high throughput sequencing-based virus, virus diagnostics, um, in terms of equipment, in terms of uh, you know time required. Um, yeah, whether you need a prior uh, knowledge of the virus or, you know, what is the detection range or specificity, um, the possibility of, you know, uh, finding new viruses or virus-like agents, and, you know, whether it is suitable for large-scale uh, diagnostic uh, processes, um, and also whether it is suitable for field samples. So uh, not, again, going through the, the each and every point of it, but just for your information, um, the more sophisticated the method is, uh, the more expensive it is. So we are trying to make sure that uh, we can uh, uh, um, we can use some of these techniques and also make sure that we can bring the cost down. So uh, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do that in in a few few slides. But before that, you know, typically in a clean plan program, in a traditional way, if you see on the left side here, say. A, a certification program is requiring 30 different tests, you know, ELISAs, PCRs. And then if it is positive, they're going to test for all those 30 different viruses. So it's going to take from days to probably months and then initiate the virus elimination process if it is positive and then do the biological index, indexing and then retest once you establish the new uh, wines through the meristem tip tissue culture. Do you want to make sure that those ones are virus free? So you're going to retest them. So that time again takes a few weeks to months. That's the traditional way of doing, but now um, high throughput sequencing is being validated and uh, being allowed in certification program. Typically you do HTS tests, which only takes like probably depending on how many number of samples, maybe it takes from days to weeks. Uh, and then once it has a positive or, um, you know, you can still go through the virus elimination, but again, you are going to cut short the time on the retesting with HTS. But if it is negative, definitely it's going to the, uh, the, the repository, uh, the germplasm repository where we call the, the G1, G2, G3, G4 um, for the multiplication or propagation purpose. So <clears throat> the bottom line here is it's going, HTS is going to cut short the time uh, if you're especially uh, dealing with the clean plant program. So in overall, you know, to give you a pros perspective of how it, it, it kind of happens, if you have a virus-infected grapevine and you want to make sure that it is virus-free and include in the repository into the clean plant program, you do the uh, virus testing. Of course, you, you're going to find positive, uh, and then you do the meristem tip tissue culture, test it with high throughput sequencing, and then um, you know, once you do the, the meristem tip tissue culture, uh, after staying a few uh, few months in the lab, it goes to the, the greenhouse and screenhouses for acclimatization. And then finally, it goes to a mother plot where, again, you have the responsibility to, to monitor them, audit test those mother blocks and make sure that uh, it just uh, follows uh, your certification standards. So with that, um, as um, uh, Star Mian has mentioned, uh, we are pleased to have this collaboration with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, Dr. Mike Rock, and you know a lot of researchers from different academic institutions like um, uh, the, the, um, the AFC, Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, uh, as well as the Canadian uh, Grapevine Certification Network. So we put together this project, especially to focus on a uh, uh, few things, uh, as, as I mentioned here, uh, the three main objectives. Once we want to automate this um, uh, high throughput sequencing process, 
uh, and also viral RNA enrichment. So we tried to find out few different methods which works better and which will be consistent in terms of uh, uh, getting the results. So we tried like double standard RNA enrichment method and we used the oligoprobes. We also used the double standard RNA binding protein to target the viral nucleic acids in a given sample. And recently uh, we were fortunate to publish with, uh, with all the collaborators mentioned here, um, uh, led by uh, Dr. Mike Rott, is that we found that uh, the double standard RNA enrichment method using the Roizen method is the, probably the best methods so far uh, in terms of consistency uh, of what we are detecting. Um, so um, if you, anybody is interested in that publication, I would be happy to send the, the electronic uh, copy of that. Um, and also uh, we wanted to, once we get this huge uh, amount of data from high throughput sequencing, we want to make sure that we have a tool that is user-friendly and also um, um, very specific and highly capable of uh, um, you know, detecting, uh, identifying these viruses from the database. So we develop, um, we, we've been developing these uh, virus tools uh, with Juki from um, um, uh, the university. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, forgot the name. Um, the, uh, especially in the optimization of web tool applications uh, that, are, that can be used like anybody who, who doesn't have uh, say, for example, Linux-based uh, knowledge. Um, so the, the idea is to bring that like a Windows-based uh, web application that anybody can upload the data and try to detect the viruses um, uh, with the high throughput sequencing data as an input. And also uh, the technology transfer of the cleansed. Uh, so we initiated a large scale national survey. Uh, we're just writing a, a manuscript on that. We uh, we have a large amount of data from all four uh, different provinces where the grapes are grown. So uh, the idea is to generate this data to say like to provide this latest information on a national survey to the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, especially on the regulatory aspect to make sure that uh, they can update or they can change their policies towards the, uh, you know, what type of pathogens that can be regulated or not. So these policy changes are very important uh, on, especially on the regulatory, regulated viruses. So with this, um, I'd like to say um, with, the, with our new funding that is supporting um, uh, from the Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, we are trying to automate the whole process of high throughput sequencing. Uh, just again, the, the main idea is to reduce the possible contamination or cross-contamination levels as well as you know, increase the sensitivity and also reduce the cost uh, that is involved through this automation process. So again, um, we have a large number of partners, as I was mentioning, um, uh, starting from uh, week, a lot of uh, genome BC centers led by genome, uh, so, sorry, so, uh, led a lot of provincial uh, genome centers uh, led by uh, genome BC. Um, and a lot of universities. Um, of course, Brock uh, is the academic lead in this one. Um, so overall, I would like to say that the Clean Plan program has three important components, uh, which is research. We always have to be on top of the game in terms of understanding the, the science and molecular diagnostics, whether the, uh, how we are going to um, classify these viruses, and also understand the epidemiology and systematic uh, studies uh, of this viral or other pathogens that are important. Uh, and also we need to uh, also keep an eye all, always on the quarantine. Uh, what are the regulations says, like expect, especially import and export? Uh, what are the national or international surveys or sanitary protocols? Or is there any policy changes? Um, and most importantly, uh, you need to have a very strong uh, technology transfer activities, uh, outreach or outreach activities for the Clean Plan program. Um, you need to have this network among different research regulatory agencies uh, to make sure that uh, you know uh, we are addressing the the problems that we have uh, through this Clean Plan program, uh, conducting educational programs, um, and also having this regional or crop specific knowledge on uh, on KTT activities. So that's very important for the successful uh, clean plan program. 
So with that, I have a few slides uh, to just to show you what is exactly happening at Brock University uh, in terms of National Clean Plan Program. So we do host uh, the, the National Grapevine Germplasm Repository um, that is um, uh, probably replicated what we have in uh, uh, CFIA facilities at Sanichton with the, uh, with the support from OGWRI as well as CGCN and Brock University. So we maintain this repository in both tissue culture lab in different levels, as well as in the phytotron. Um, these are the number of uh, plants that, uh, that the varieties that we have. I'm not going through the numbers here. Um, so again, um, just a passing slide, like how many cyan or uh, rootstock varieties that we have right now in the lab, um, um, how we are maintaining in the lab right now. But we, we're trying to expand this into a more um, um, uh, a bigger clean clean plant initiative. Uh, we do have virus uh, virus cultures because we want to use them as a as a controls in our diagnostic uh, uh, methods. Um, so I just want to end the presentation with a couple of slides here with the recent funding that we received from uh, uh, <clears throat> Canada Foundation for Innovation as well as the Ontario Research Fund. As you can see, this red dot here is the Brock University. We are um, uh, three kilometers away from the university. We have a 50-acre land farm uh, that is going to be developed into a more um, focused on uh, sustainable agriculture research, especially uh, focusing on the clean plant program. As you can see, this is uh, just a rendering from the from the architecture. Um, so um, we'll be building some greenhouses. A uh, lot of greenhouses, 18,000 square foot. There is a research building. And more importantly, we'll have a research uh, vineyard where we'll be hosting these mother blocks, not just in these greenhouses and greenhouses. Uh, we'll be establishing the probably the first, um, the clean grape wine, uh, the mother block uh, uh, to support this uh, uh, initiative. So these are the people involved, uh, me, myself, and Jim Wilworth um, are leading this initiative. Um, there are other um, uh, professors with different uh, backgrounds uh, are all involved in this project. Um, so basically, um, uh, we hope to um, initiate this um, uh, construction within the next few months as the archeological surveys and everything is going on. Um, so, I think with that, I'm going to stop here and uh, probably take any questions if you have. Um, yep, thanks for the reminder. Juki is from University of Victoria. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, thanks. Sid. That was uh, um, really awesome presentation. Um, do we have other questions? Okay. I have a question. Um, is there work being done, or is it possible to um, develop a virus resistant work rootstock? Is that something that um, there there is some. Um research that's that's been going on uh, to develop some some virus resistant uh, rootstocks but not at the phase that we are imagining um, um, so far we haven't found any natural resistance uh, probably uh, that is something that you know the the, the breeders the grape point breeders should come come, come together and uh, probably focus on that especially given the perennial nature of this uh, uh, this this crop um, I, I'm sure uh, breeding programs would focus more on that in the coming future. Do we have any idea um, which is the greater culprit, the scion or the rootstock? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, given the, the symptomology, like what we have seen so far, um, certain cultivars, like if you see red-fruited viniferas, cafranc, uh, white fruited viniferas, Chardonnay, these are the first ones. Uh, these these are the ones that we use as an indicators. Yeah. Uh, so those are very susceptible to, uh, say for example, red blotch and leaf hole. Um, uh, but you know, it's hybrids for example, uh, just specific hybrids, they don't show 
as dramatic symptoms as uh, as these viniferas. Um, you know, that's probably because the the, the, the growth is uh, um, always there and probably it can withstand a little better uh, because of the vigor of the plant. Um, and certain certain varieties doesn't show symptoms. So, um, I guess with um, viruses' mm -hmm. capacity to um, mutate so quickly, um, that still would be an issue, right? If you, yeah. Yeah, um, well, given the, the nature of these viruses, uh, we do know that certain type of viruses um, can mutate uh, uh, quickly than others, but it all depends on like, there are some, like how much is the, the external pressure, so how much is the population pressure, especially that, that's very important when you, when you talk about the mutations, um, because we are doing the monocultures, we're putting a lot of um, uh, em emphasis on growing certain number of uh, certain type of uh, varieties uh, um, in large acres at the same place. And then if you have a lot of insect population and the virus population, the conditions, the climatic condition favors them, yeah, the, there, it will create a lot of disease pressure and that's actually uh, causes the, the, the source for the mutations. Um, yeah, anyone else have a question? I'm sorry, I can't really see. The, oh, I had um, a question. Okay. Yeah, I see the. Pardon me. Um, I was wondering to help reduce the turnaround time on propagating uh, grafted material. Is there any way in the tissue culture lab to take uh, splices and graft on a micro scale the rootstock with the scion in like a. That's that's a great question, uh, Taylor. Um, because these are traditionally propagated and, you know, growers used to this type of uh, propagation material uh, because you know, traditionally you are going in the winter and getting those lignified canes and graft them uh, and make, uh, make a successful graft. And that's very strong uh, plant that you are getting after maybe eight, eight to 10 months or sometimes more than that. Um, so you are talking about like a, a a foot and a half uh, size, uh, length plant that is very rigid um, uh, and people are used to it once you plant it so you are expected that okay within four uh, four years you are going to see the first uh, first crop um, 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 at, a, at a reasonable rate uh, but when it comes to the tissue culture uh, or green propagation or shoot culture propagation from the tissue culture plant um, it is possible you can have um, we are we are doing a lot of research on like the green grafting, micro grafting, things like that. But the, the, the issue is uh, again one of the more limiting factors. It's not like a graft that we can make. We can make grafts, but how long it's going to take from that plant to acclimatize and be uh, field uh, field ready? So that's that's the limitation that we are seeing right now. Um, it is possible you can have some micro graftings or green graftings. Still, there are a lot of research going on because we are dealing with a lot of varieties of uh, rootstocks and cyan combinations, the success rates. Yeah, it's a big, big issue. So you need to standardize all those protocols. There are a lot of research going on in that area. But again, when it comes, if it is a one rooted plant, that's fine because you can do the shoot cultures, try to um, grow them under the greenhouse conditions or shady conditions, and then acclimatize. You can you can have a lot of plants. But the, the question is like, how long we had to wait? You need to wait two years to get into a field or three years, um, whether they're going to perform the same way as the traditionally uh, grafted plants, um, questions to answer. Yeah, just in BC, there's such a demand, and it for is also the wineries that are struggling to get an income. I'm curious if you can kind of cut down that turnaround time with what you said, um, micro grafting, and also I have another question with some of the tissue culture labs in the cannabis industry that are pretty proficient at this kind of work. Right. Um, is there any way around the regulation of Health Canada of the grapevine industry utilizing their 
pretty much empty space that has available for tissue culture um, services. Have you heard? Uh, I don't think so, because you can propagate the grape wine anywhere you want. You don't have uh, regulations like what we have for the cannabis. So uh, you are free to uh, do tissue culture. I don't think you need, you need to even have any kind of uh, permission from the government if you want to do that, except if you want to maintain the ISO standards or some, some kind of uh, you know, uh, laboratory safety standards. Other than that, I think uh, anybody is free to do. Yeah, I think it may be those regulations on their side for the cannabis production that cannabis production yeah there are a lot of regulations because we, yeah. we've been going through getting our uh, cannabis license renewed at Brock University as I know the whole process it's, it's a nightmare so <laughs> anyhow thank you very much thank you Hey, could you, um, you mentioned before the call that um, there is an announcement on the re enhanced replant, replant program. Could you comment on that? Because I think it involves certified plant material. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I think Lindsay Hainstock's on the line and maybe she'd be the best oh, yeah. one to make that announcement if she's uh, available to do that on short notice, but to, uh, Otherwise, um, happy to. Oh, there we go. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Hey, Hi, Lindsay. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. I'm just gonna um, switch over where I'm looking at the video here. So, can you repeat the question then? Um, so there was an announcement on the enhanced replant program that came out today, and so just wanted to uh, see if you were able to share some of that while you're on the line with us. And sure. How, um, how ironically, I was just editing some of the stuff on this right now. Um, <laughs> So it has officially been announced, yay. Um, the application window is gonna open up at the end of October. I don't have the dates exactly in front of me, but what it'll be is IAF is gonna have that typical idea where you have, I think it's about three weeks they're giving that you can log in, start your application process, and then it's gonna be a one week window that you hit the submit button for applying. So. Yeah, what we're hoping to is we'll organize some webinars where we can have some Q&A leading up to the application windows opening so that way everybody can get prepared and know what's going to be involved. But I do recommend everybody goes to the Investment Agriculture Foundation website to get the information on the program. And if there's any specific questions, I'll try and answer right now. Um, does it require certified um, plant material? Yes. Okay. Yes, so we got we got full support on that one um, that we are going to be requiring that it has to be either certified material directly through the CGCN or a recognized virus program by CGCN. So for some of our people who are looking to import um, nursery stock from the United States or from Europe, they will have to be buying from a nursery that is following a program that is recognized by CGCN. And so that is gonna limit some. I know the one we're getting a lot of questions on right now is France. France is currently undergoing a process with CGCN to have their program reviewed. So if anyone is ordering plant nursery stock from any of these nurseries, um, their application will be approved pending that final decision by CGCN. So unfortunately that is, kind of keeping things in limbo a bit, but CGCN is anticipating having that review done at least by the end of March of 2025. So it would be before the plants go into the ground in the spring. Thanks, Lindsay. And, You're and welcome. Um, yeah. and Hans, if, yeah. it, does the CGCN give, um, does the website give information on sources of certified plant material? <laughs> Well, the CGCN is recognizing the, the programs, the state-run programs from California, Oregon, Washington, and New York State. And these are state-sponsored certification programs that have somewhat similar uh, uh, standards. The French program is still under review, but uh, there are many questions in regards to the French program. The, uh, Sorry. So, so nursery, I, I can't predict the outcome of the review, really. So nursery by nursery, like if you're buying from a California nursery, you need to see that they're certified by the California body. 
correct? Yeah, if I can help with that one a little bit too. Um, it even can be down to the variety level sometimes with nurseries. So even within Canada here, there might be some nurseries that have stock that they're selling that is not certified, that has not been going through the process. So I really do encourage people to make sure they're having a good conversation when they're ordering their nursery stock to ensure that the actual specific variety is has gone through the process and would be recognized as certified. Now the plant needs to be certified, not the nursery. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And if I may, uh, do we have a minute? I, I had a question regarding high throughput uh, sequencing that uh, actually, uh, yeah, Sud has uh, uh, kind of answered in the field. But uh, from the certifier's point of view, you know, the uh, cost is really the, the biggest obstacle in terms of uh, certifying through diagnostics. But this is, you know, in the long term, this is really the only thing that really works. But uh, uh, one of the things, I mean, if we could actually run HTS uh, diagnostics in the field, plant by plant, that would reduce the cost of, uh, you know, sample collection, sample preparation, et cetera, in the lab quite considerably. Yeah. And I, I don't know, where, you know, I also don't know where the future brings us in terms of diagnostics. And that seems to be changing every two, three years. Uh, and I don't know what the next better thing after HDS is going to be, but I'm pretty sure some something will come out eventually. Yeah, not not that I think of anything uh, for now. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, doing uh, probably a composite sampling, uh, especially with HDS, where you can, um, through our initial like uh, research, we can do composite samples of 40, 40 different wines in one sample, which kind of saves a lot of money. But again, um, if we some, find something positive, then we have to go back <laughs> and then do do the testing again uh, on individual wines. But yeah, um, it's it's always good to invest if you have establishing the mother block um, or propagation block. Um, it's probably best way to invest on the HTS so that you know you will have a, a very comprehensive idea of uh, what is there, what is not there, um, and then you can take a strategic strategic decisions. I know how you want to uh, go further. Thanks. Um, okay, thanks, Sid. We promised Sid that we had a hard stop um, and we're four minutes over. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I had to go for another meeting, so. <laughs> thank, thanks very much. Um, and we'll, we'll have your presentation um, on our website and um, Kate will send out information to contact you if people have individual questions. And I encourage those of you on the call to let your colleagues know that this presentation is up because um, it's very informative and I'm sure that going forward, there's gonna be questions. So um, thanks again, Sid, I'm, I'm sure we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Kate, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the invitation. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. And if you have any questions, uh, there is an email, you can yeah. reach out to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Um, our third Thursday for October is the 17th, and it's uh, Dr. Simone Castellarin um, giving us an update on his heat stress related work. So we'll see you then. Thanks.